I don't know what to say. I feel very lucky to be here. I feel very lucky to know Alain, to have known him for a while. He's been a good friend. Um, once I lost a CD and he bought a new copy for me. <laughs> what kind of a friend is that? That's, that's a good friend. Ah, that was I, uh, Francis Cabrel. Yeah. Exactly, Francis Cabrel. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah. Um, right, so I want to talk about something which I, uh, well, you, you, you may see in a little while why I, why I chose this subject, besides the fact that I actually have been thinking about it. Um, so this is my title, On the Coomological Dimension of Automorphism Groups of Right-Angled Art Groups. Can you actually see that? Uh -huh. I mean the, the highlighting? Okay. So uh, I started this project some time ago with Ruth Charney, and I have, we have some very recent results with uh, Ben Millard, who's a, a student at University College in London. So I'm going to talk about right-angled art and groups. Um, most people here probably know all what they are already, but let me just go through the definition. So uh, they're finitely generated groups. And what makes it a, a finitely generated group, a right-angled art and group, is that some of the generators may commute, and there are no other relations. Meaning you don't have to say any other relations in order to define uh, the group. That gives you de the defining relations of the group. So the way you usually uh, describe a right-angled Artin group, a general right-angled Artin group, is by drawing a graph. So uh, if you have a simplicial graph, then uh, the Artin group you get, this is the reg. The generators are the vertices of gamma. And the relations, well, you say that two generators commute if and only if there's an edge between those two ed vertices of the graph. Well. There's V and there's W, and they're joined by an edge in the graph. Okay, so that way, by just drawing a simple graph, you can describe exactly what your group is. So I thought I would draw some examples on five generators. There's an example of a graph. It doesn't have very many edges. In fact, it doesn't have any edges. So it's got five generators, and none of them commute, so that's the free group. I could, uh, on the other hand, I could go to the other extreme <coughs> and take the same, same five generators and draw an edge between every pair of vertices Did I miss any? No. Uh, I missed one. Okay. So every two generators commute, so that's a free abelian group. I'm used to having a, um, a lectern that's a little taller that I don't, yeah, but anyway. Um, and then, but in general, you can have pretty much anything. You could have, for instance, these three generators commute, giving you a little free group of rank, a uh, free abelian group of rank three, and here's a free abelian group of rank two, and those aren't connected, so um, the top three don't commute with the bottom three, so you get a Z cubed free product with a z squared, etc. <coughs> Basically, you can do anything you want, and you get a group, A gamma. Okay, so you, if I draw you a picture of a graph like that, then that d gives me um, some, uh, some groups, right-angled art groups. So these are amazingly <coughs> simple to define. And if you've been paying any attention at all to geometric group theory or um, three manifold theory, you've learned that they have lots, in spite of the fact that they're so simple, they have an extremely rich uh, class of subgroups 
which include, for instance, virtually, they include all hyperbolic three manifold groups, for instance. Sorry? Do you allow infinite? No, finite graphs. These are okay. finitely generated mm -hmm. groups. Um, right, so what I wanted to talk about today is automorphism groups of right angled art and groups. So if you start on the left hand side, if you look, you get the group of automorphisms of a free group. On the right hand side over here, you get the automorphism group of z to the fifth, z to the n which of course is the same as the general linear group. And since I'm basically a topologist, uh, instead of thinking about, I, I don't, well, I'm the sort of a topologist that doesn't like to keep track of base points, which means I'm not a really good algebraic topologist, but I'm a low, low dimensional topologist, so instead of thinking about automorphisms of free groups, I want to think of outer automorphisms of free groups. And of course that doesn't change uh, anything about uh, GLNZ. So these are two classes of groups that have been, we've been studying for quite some time now, and we know a lot of things about them. Um, what I want to do now is try to take the things that we know about these, things that we understand about them, and try to see what I can learn about, in particular, the outer automorphism group of a general right-angled Artin group. So uh, here's a list of properties. There's actually quite a long list of properties by now that, uh, are, that are both everything on the left and everything on the right. Um, share, there are, for instance, lots and lots of finiteness properties. Um, they're finitely presented, <coughs> and so that implies in particular that their two-dimensional homology is finitely generated, and their one-dimensional homology. And it's also true that in every dimension the homology is finitely generated. Mm. Both of them have torsion-free subgroups of finite index. So that means um, uh, the cohomological dimension of those sub you can compute the cohomological dimension of those subgroups, and it turns out to be finite. Um, and uh, this is big news. Uh, this is basically um, Kaluba. Uh, uh, Kielak, uh, yeah, Nowak, and also you have to put Ozawa in there. Okay, so if you read Alain's book um, about property T, there's a section at the end where he has a list of open problems. <laughs> Number one on the list is does out of uh, out of Fn and out of Fn, do they have property T? Okay, so um, I'm actually not going to talk. I wish I could talk about property T. Actually, Alain invited me to Neuchatel in 2002 and um, tried to convince me that property T was interesting. And he convinced <laughs> me it was interesting, but I had no idea how to do anything about it. Um, so. I wish I could be standing here right now telling you the proof that out of Fn has property T, but you have to invite those guys instead. Um, so, yeah, so the exciting things are happening in the world of out of Fn. Excuse me, please. What yeah? did you say about property T? The outer automorphism group of yes. Fn? So does the automorph. Yes. For n, For n at least six. N at least five. five. N at least five. So does the automorphism group. I just, since I'm talking about outer automorphisms yeah, in this, I, I, I mentioned out. Um, so those are properties, those are, that's just a, a small part of the, the list of properties that these uh, groups share. And there's lots of other things, like they have finitely many conjugacy classes of finite subgroups, there's homology stability theorems, and the list goes on. But they're definitely not the same, same group. 
And there's a lot of ways in which they're different. For one thing, um, GLNZ is a linear group. Um, out of Fn is not. I mentioned that they both have finite virtual cohomological dimension, but there's a big difference for out of Fn, it's linear in N. And for GLNZ, it's quadratic in N. Um, another difference, big difference, between out of Fn and GLNZ is that every solvable subgroup of, GLNZ, of out of Fn is virtually, virtually abelian. And in GLNZ, it's definitely not true. Um, you could say it's virtually polycyclic. Um, property T distinguishes the two groups, at least for n equals 3. For n equals 3, of course, GL3Z has property T, but out of Fn does not. So that's been known for a long time. It has a subgroup of finite index that maps on to uh, Z. Um, Sorry, and what about N4? Is open? N equals 4 is open. Yeah. Right. Uh, other things that distinguish these, uh, kind of related to the, uh, the, the vine yeah, so the Dane function, which measures how hard it is to solve the word problem in a group. For out of Fn, it's exponential. And for GLNZ, it's polynomial. And actually, there's other big news in out of Fn that um, is not so, uh, hasn't maybe received as much press as property T. So there's something you can define for a group that has torsion free subgroups of finite index called the rational Euler characteristic, which is just the usual Euler characteristic of the subgroup of finite index divided by its index. And for GLNZ, Burrell, I believe, proved a long time that the rational ago that the rational Euler characteristic is zero. Uh, I think of n is at least three. And it was just proved, it's actually not even on the archive yet, that for um, out of Fn, the rational Euler characteristic is always negative and it grows uh, more than exponentially. With n. The introduction of S3, S3, uh, GLN, GL3z is uh, exponential to the rational Euler characteristic. No, no, no. the introduction of the GL3z. Is uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, this is greater than three. No, but for n equals three, for GL. Yes, it GL3Z is exponential. Is exponential. Yes, GL3z. You're right. It's GL4, and uh, it's, it's polynomial. <laughs> Who proved that on the rational uh, Euler character? This, uh, well, I have to, so this is not the subject of my talk, but I have to say this. So this is proved by um, somebody named Michael <laughs> Borinsky. He's a physicist, and um, he proved it. So a long time ago, um, John Smiley and I made the, this uh, conjecture that the Euler characteristic is negative and grows more than exponentially with n. Uh, and we did some work on the Euler characteristic. In particular, we, dis we, uh, we used a certain function, which we called tau, <coughs> to do a calculation. And we found uh, some sort of a generating function. But uh, we couldn't tell whether, and we generated lots of, of um, numbers. We, we generated uh, the Euler characteristics for rank up to 10. And then Don Zagier simplified our, our generating function and got it up to 100. And they seemed to do this, so we made a conjecture. But what Berinsky realized is that this function tau can be thought of as a character on the kahn krimer hopf algebra of graphs which physicists have been studying and using to calculate Feynman diagrams. 
And so he used some things he knew about this, the number theory associated to this Hopf algebra to prove this. Okay, I'm, I'm done. But lots of exciting things are happening in out of FN. Um, right. So the, the general question that I wanted to, that I want, that I'm curious about is how does the shape of gamma actually affect um, the group of outer automorphisms and its subgroups? In particular, w these properties, you know, which are true for all out of A gamma. How do you tell when uh, one property holds in some set of graphs and not in others, et cetera? So what I wanted to address today, what's in my a title is uh, the virtual cohomological dimension. So I want to study that. So in order to study this group, I need to know like what's in it. So uh, we have to start by, I'm going to start by talking about some basic elements of, uh, of uh, out of A gamma. So let's start with a graph. Any old graph, I just threw, I'm going to use that one as an example throughout the lecture. So there's a, there's a couple of obvious kinds of invert of uh, automorphisms. If I take um, a generator V and send it to its inverse, and send everything el else uh, to itself, then that gives me an automorphism. All I have to do to make sure I've got an automorphism is preserve that commuting relations are, are satisfied. So if I just invert a generator, it still commutes with everything it used to. Another obvious type of automorphism is a graph automorphism. So if I have, for instance, this, uh, this graph has an automorphism that kind of flips along the diagonal, interchanges V and B, C and W, U and A. Again, if edges were connected before, they're going to be connected afterward. So the graph automorphisms actually induce um, automorphisms of A gamma. The subgroup generated by inversions and graph automorphisms <coughs> is finite. So that's just a little tiny bit of the group of, in general, the, of the group of automorphisms of A gamma. So how do you get infinite order automorphisms? Well, you think about uh, z to the n. How do you get an infinite order automorphism of z to the n? You send, <coughs> uh, you take an elementary matrix, right? You send a, uh, one of the basis vectors to Ei plus Ej. Uh, so those are elementary matrices. And they have infinite order. For the free group, you do something that looks almost the same. You take a generator. So if this is A1 up to An, you can send Ai to Ai times Aj. Call that rho Ij. That's an automorphism. You can undo it by multiplying Ai by, AI by Aj inverse. Uh, and, and you don't do anything to the other guys. But notice that that's different from multiplying on the other side. So those are two kinds of automorphisms, uh, right and left. Uh, those are called right and left Nielsen automorphisms. Okay, so, so that's really easy um, and extremely well known. But for A gamma, for a general graph, you need to be more careful. You can't send, you can't, uh, uh, yeah, you need to preserve the commuting relations, right? If you do something to a generator, you can't just arbitrarily multiply it by another generator. If you do that, you better make sure that the result still commutes with everything it used to. So what do you do? How do you get infinite order automorphisms of A gamma? Well, here's the general idea. You choose a vertex. Uh, I'm going to choose 
this one. And I'm going to look at the star of this vertex in the graph, which means the full subgraph spanned by everything that's by it and everything that's a distance uh, one. So here's the star of M in this picture. And then I'm going to look at the component. I'm going to take uh, the star out of the graph and look at the components of what's left. So there's one component and there's another component. So I've, I'm going to look at these components. In the first case, you can really see that? Kind okay, of, yeah. kind of. I should use a darker color. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Never mind, I'll stop playing. Okay. <coughs> um, <coughs> right. If the, uh, the, the, the component on the left, it's, only, it's a singleton. It's only got one guy. Um, everything that commutes with U also commutes with M. So I can actually take U and multiply it by M and do no harm. I've still preserved all the commuting relationships. And I can do that on either side. Okay? On the other hand, if I've got a component with um, more than two vertices in it, like C2 over there, then I can't do that. I can't multiply A by M because uh, then it would uh, it used to commute with B and it no longer does. So, but I, what I can do is conjugate the entire com uh, component by M. And the fact, the rest of the graph won't notice that I've done that because it's kind of isolated from M by as far as it knows I, I uh, yeah, I haven't done anything. So, in fact, that also gives me uh, 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 an automorphism of, of gamma. So, I can't get away with just these multiplying one generator by another. I have to either, sometimes I can multiply a generator by the other, sometimes I can conjugate a component of uh, this gamma minus the star by the generator. But anyway, these uh, types of automorphisms, they're all in infinite order and they're called, whoops, I didn't want to highlight that, I wanted to highlight this. They're called gamma whitehead automorphisms. I should probably call them gamma Nielsen automorphisms. But, and then the theorem is that uh, the group of all automorphisms and therefore the group of outer automorphisms too is generated by inversions, graph automorphisms, these elementary gamma whitehead automorphisms that I just told you about, and one more type of automorphism is called twists. So what's a twist? Well, it too multiplies uh, one generator by another, but in this case, the generators commute. What I did up here, uh, I multiplied U by M, and they don't commute. But uh, if I multiply, so the, the twists, yeah, I, I'm multiplying V by M, but V and M commute. So that's different. Um, so notice that if, if I started with a free group, then I don't need the twists. In fact, I don't have any twists because no generators commute. And for the, on the other hand, if I of uh, a gamma is z to the n, then I only need actually one in inversions and twists. I don't have any of these gamma whitehead automorphisms. If I conjugate stuff by an element of uh, z to the n, nothing happens. Um, so, uh, but in general, this is what you get. You really need all those different kinds of automorphisms. So. For, um, for general uh, A-gammas, the, the twist subgroups uh, is actually very well understood. So uh, the answer is that it, it's uh, the subgroup generated by those twists is actually injects into the general linear group, and you know, can say exactly what its image is. The image lies in a parabolic subgroup that you can write down specifically, and you can 
Anything you want to know about this, you can just read off from this representation, including, for instance, its virtual cohomological dimension. So the twist subgroup we understand. So what I'm going to talk about today is what we call the untwisted subgroup. So it's sub the subgroup generated by everything except twists. So a couple of remarks about these two subgroups. First of all, every automorphism can be written as a product of a twist and an untwisted subgroup, an untwist, and yeah. Yeah, you can put all, the, uh, put all the twists in front of all of the, of the untwisted guys, if you like. So um, you can write this as a product. The intersection of these two groups is very small. It's just inversions, the, su the subgroup of inversions. Uh, it's an interesting group. It really kind of measures the difference, well, the kernel of the map from out of A gamma to GLNZ that you get by abelianizing A gamma uh, kind of measures the difference between out of A gamma and GLNZ. And that, that group, which is an interesting group, is contained in this U of A gamma. And of course, if there aren't any twists, then it's equal to U of A gamma is actually, actually equal out of A gamma. <coughs> so this is the group we're going to study. We're going to study this untwisted subgroup. So to explain what I, how I do this, I want to go back to the case of the free group. Uh, when we wanted to study the group of outer automorphisms of the free group, um, we built a simplicial complex called K sub n. What are the vertices? Um, yeah, what are the vertices? How can I say this efficiently? Uh, these are graphs. Oops. Uh, G, together with isomorphisms from the free group on n generators to, to pi 1 of G. Now, so I haven't put in a base point there because I don't care about base points. So this is uh, right. But I have an isomorphism from the free group to pi n of g. And what's an edge? I get an edge from g to g prime. So, so these are the vertices of my simplicial complex. I get an edge from g to g prime. If g prime is g, and I'm going to collapse some edges. Um, in an acyclic subgraph. So we call an ASIC, so that's a subgraph with no cycles, so we'll call that a forest. So edges are, we call them forest collapses, and a K simplex is a chain of K forest collapses. Okay, so the group, um, that's a simplicial complex easy to describe. Um, and how does the group of outer automorphisms act? Well, one, uh, a vertex comes with this isomorphism from the free group to the fundamental group, and the out of Fn just acts by changing the isomorphism. So I've got an isomorphism with Fn to pi 1 of g. If I take an automorphism, that gives me a new isomorphism from um, Fn to pi 1 of g. So that's, that's a simplicial complex. The group of outer automorphisms acts. And the theorem that Mark and I proved in 1986 was that this, this simplicial complex is contractible. The action of out of Fn is proper, meaning it has finite stabilizers, and co-compact. So let me just draw some pictures. That there is a picture of a, one of the vertices of Kn. It's uh, called a rose, because it's supposed to look like a rose. And 
the edges are marked with elements of a basis of the free group. That gives the isomorphism with the free group. Okay, so that's a point, that's a vertex. What does a neighbor of this thing look like? Well, here's a neighbor. Okay, there's another graph, and that's supposed to tell you, you can see some loops in there, they go up an edge and down the tree, and uh, that gives me, uh, um, yeah, that's a, a point. And uh, I claim that these two are connected by an edge, because if I just collapse this edge, I get that. On the other hand, <coughs> um, Okay, so another, here's another neighbor. Basically, I can draw any graph I want, draw a maximal tree in the graph, and label the rest of the edges by these A's. And then I can collapse one edge to get that picture, and I can collapse two edges to get this picture. Uh, this is, what, this is E and this is F etc. Right? So there's a little picture of a neighborhood uh, of a couple of vertices in this complex, in this simplicial complex that are next to my, um, to my ro rows. So what's the precise construction when you, when you said you take all graphs, of course there are... Two yeah, yeah. So I, I've been... Morphism classes or you have to rigidify them in some way or what do you take? I take, I, I've been a little um, cavalier here, I take um, I only take graphs, all of whose vertices are at least trivalent, and they're connected, and uh, I take isomorphism classes. Yes. Um, right. I, I guess, so I've been talking about this since 1986, and it always surprises me that everybody doesn't, I mean, it's like when you teach calculus. You kind of think they ought to know this by now. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry if I'm a little bit glib. Um. <laughs> right. So that's, that's, a, that's a space. Um, I want to uh, give another kind of a description of uh, what the neighborhood of a rose looks like in this <coughs> complex. And to do that, I have to move to partitions. So there's a very well-known correspondence between trees and partitions, namely if I have a tree and I have an edge in the tree, then that naturally gives me a partition of the other vertices. So um, for instance, this edge in this tree gives me a partition of the vertices of the tree into two pieces, the vertices that are in here and the vertices are out he that are out here. If I have two different edges, that gives me two different partitions, and they're compatible in some sense. The sense is very precise. Uh, there are two, so the partition has two sides, and I can choose a side of one and a side of the other so that they're actually disjoint. So, in a, or another way to say that is you can draw circles representing the partitions that don't intersect. And in general, I can uh, describe my whole tree as uh, a set of partitions. I have a partition for every edge in my tree. Okay, so there's a, there's a well-known correspondence between partitions of sets of elements and um, finite partitions and finite trees. So I guess you don't even have to say finite. Okay, and the nice thing about this is, <coughs> yeah, well I, I already did this. Uh, I can actually re reconstruct the tree from the partition. So if I have a partition like that, then there's a tree. I just put a vertex in every component of the partition, of the complementary sets, <coughs> and connect the dots if there's a circle between them. Okay, so trees and partitions. Now, 
when I was talking about the uh, neighborhood of my rows, I was talking about graphs together with a, with a uh, maximal tree. So if I have, if T is actually a maximal tree in a graph, so I've got, you know, edges, I don't know, I have too many edges. We don't have that much time. So there's a maximal tree in my graph. Then, uh, and all of these edges, remember, were labeled AI. Then if I take one of these partitions corresponding to an edge, whoops, I wanted a blue partition. It actually not only partic partitions the vertices, it partitions the vertices of the tree, but I can also think of it as a partition of the half edges of my uh, generating set, right? And I look at the, uh, maybe the, th the way to do this is cut all these half edges into two pieces, AI and AI inverse, and put, um, AI and AI inverse in the same piece of the partition if they uh, end at the same, same uh, vertex in the tree. So what am I saying? Um, not only could I construct th this tree from this set of partitions, I could also reconstruct my marked graph from the set of partitions. I could, right, I know, I know how to glue in the extra edges if I know these partitions. So, for instance, uh, in the two graphs that uh, I had in my, the neighborhood of my rows, uh, the first one, I have this one edge, and uh, the front, actually in this one, the front edge of all three uh, generators is on one end of the edge, and the back edges are all at the other end. So that gives me a, uh, this graph corresponds to that partition, and uh, the second graph, I've got two edges in the partition, two edges in the tree, two partitions, and that tells me how to reconstruct that graph. So, uh, yeah, and the, the punchline is that I can reconstruct the graph from this partition, uh, this set of partitions, uh, and each PE partitions the set of generators. Okay, so what this boils down to in the end is that I can describe the link of a rose in my simplicial complex as actually just the geometric realization of the partially ordered set of compatible sets of partitions. A compatible set of partitions gives a tree. Uh, if I throw out one of the partitions, I collapse an edge in the tree. If I throw out all the partitions, I get the rows. And uh, so the dimension of this space is the number of uh, partitions in a maximal collection of compatible partitions. Okay, so that's a picture. So why did I go all through, through all that? Well, I claim that these uh, gamma whitehead automorphisms I was talking about, things that are actually automorphisms of A gamma, can also be described in terms of partitions. In fact, partitions of the generators of my right-angled Arden group, which, remember, are the vertices of the graph. So how do I do that? Let me remind you of um, the kinds of uh, automorphisms I was talking about. For instance, I had this picture, and I said I could multiply u by m. Well, um, the link of m doesn't play. So I've written down the, the, the vertices, which are the generators, and their inverses in a list. And they kind of separate into sets. There's, uh, I shouldn't, don't actually want this part in the set, 
Uh, there's the link of M, which just consists of V and W and their inverses. And then there are these, there's M itself and its inverse. And then there's U and its inverse, which I treated separately. And then there's these components, C plus or minus. So how do I draw a picture of, how do I draw a partition that represents, for instance, the, the whitehead automorphism that multiplies U by M? Well, I just uh, partition U and M from the rest of the, of the components. How do I draw uh, a partition that, uh, yeah, so that was, you goes, you goes, yeah. What about uh, if I want to do, I want to multiply uh, on the left instead of the right? Well, I claim that this does that. And I want to think of that as multiplying u inverse on the right by m. So it multiplies u on the left by n m inverse. And what about a picture of this uh, partial, this conjugation? Well, I just take m and separate it from n inverse and put c inverse in the same, same way. So these are examples, as I said, of elementary gamma whitehead automorphisms. There is a much more general uh, thing, uh, thing called a gamma whitehead automorphism. So it's a combination of these basic ones. So it multiplies some generators on the right, some generators on the left by u inverse, and some components it conjugates. So here's the, the general uh, um, picture. You have, you, got, you start with your vertex M and you write a list of all those components and all those singletons and their inverses. And then you partition that set into two pieces. You have to separate M from M inverse. So those are the th kinds of things I've done. Um, and then you define the automorphism by you multiply um, something on the right by M if it's inside, if it's in one piece of the partition in the side containing M and uh, you don't do anything if it's outside the side containing N. So let me just do one more example. Uh, so there's a partition, it, ha it separates M from N M inverse. It contains two guys, one of the singletons and one of the components. And what do I do? Well, if something's inside P, uh, so I have to conjugate everything A, B, A, and B by M, and I have to multiply U inverse by M. Uh, yeah, multiplying U inverse by M is like multiplying U on the left by M inverse, and A is in P, so I have to multiply it on the right by M, but A inverse is also in P, so I have to multiply A on the left by M inverse, so that gives me a conjugation. Okay, so it's a fairly simple rule. There's a partition. The partition has to be the right sort of, it has to keep these components together. Um, and it has to separate M from N inverse. <laughs> and given any such picture, I get a gamma whitehead automorphism. And I call the partition a gamma whitehead partition based at M. Okay. So now we get to how do we study this group. So um, Ruth and uh, a student of hers, uh, uh, Nate Stambach and I, in a paper that just came out in 2017, we defined a simplicial complex like the one I defined for a free group. But now the vertices, instead of being graphs, they're, um, they're certain special cat zero, or NPC, locally cat zero, cube complexes. 
So a graph is just a locally cat zero cube complex. The cubes are one dimensional, but they're cubes. Uh, 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 yeah, but they have to have with the right fundamental group, and you have to have an isomorphism of pi 1 with um, uh, a gamma. And what's an edge? You get an edge between x and x prime. Well, for graphs, we collapsed an edge. Here we have a higher dimensional thing. Instead of collapsing an edge, we're going to collapse an i bundle, so a product of a graph with an interval. <coughs> x prime obtained from x by collapsing a certain type of I bundle. And again, I'm being a little vague. There, there are um, details here. So what we did is we defined this complex, and then we proved it's actually contractible. And this subgroup of untwisted automorphisms acts properly and co-compactly. Uh, the minimal vertex, so for, for the free group, it was a, this rose. So what's the analog here? It's the so-called Salvetti complex. So it has a generator for a, a loop for every vertex of gamma. And it has a torus uh, t to the n for uh, cliques in gamma. So, for instance, if two vertices are joined in the gamma are joined by an edge, you have two uh, generators of the um, a gamma, and you sew in a torus to make those two generators the meridian and the longitude. And you do that in higher dimensions too. So that just by construction gives you a space with the right fundamental group, and it turns out to be loc and it's locally uh, cat zero, non positively curved. Okay, but we actually don't, don't need to understand what kind of spaces these are because we have a description of these spaces in terms of partitions, just as we did for the free group. Uh, in fact, if you take one of these minimal guys, these Salvetti's, and decide what's around it, it's exactly the same as before. It's, uh, um, Every vertex in this link is div given by a compatible collection of partitions. Now, you have to be fairly careful about what you mean by compatible here, but there's a definition which works. So, um, you got this cube complex, and it's, uh, sorry, this uh, simplicial complex, um, and uh, the vertices are collections of compatible partitions. Um, so, as before, the dimension of k gamma is the number of um, partitions in a maximal collection. Okay, so where have we got? I said I was supposed to be talking about virtual cohomological dimension. Well, I have a proper uh, action of a group on a contractible space. So the dimension of that space gives me an upper bound on the virtual cohomological dimension. And actually, when we wrote this paper, we conjectured that this would be exactly the virtual cohomological dimension. But story's not quite over. It'll be over in five minutes, because that's how much longer I have. <laughs> how do you get a lower bound? Well. Uh, an easy way to get a lower bound is find a free abelian subgroup of rank R, of some rank, rank R. Then R, then, then the VCD of U of A gamma is at least R. And of course, it's less than or equal to the dimension of k gamma. 
which as we've seen is just the uh, number of partitions in this maximal collection. Okay, so where do we go from here? We, we have this nice dimensional space. We would like to find a free abelian subgroup of the same dimension as the space, because then we would sh have shown that the VCD was exactly that dimension. So the idea is, um, I'm going to be very sketchy now, you, you, ta you take one of these compatible collections, and uh, so given any of these partitions, you've seen that they, they correspond to automorphisms, these gamma, these gamma whitehead automorphisms. So now you think about, well, when do the two of these automorphisms commute? They don't always commute, but sometimes they do, and it turns out you can decide exactly when they're going to commute, and if there's a partition in your set that you don't like, you can often get rid of it and replace it by another one, which will commute with more things. So this requires lots of sort of cute combinatorics. Yeah, which I shouldn't tell you about. Um, and if you're lucky, you can replace all of the <coughs> uh, partitions in your biggest collection by ones corresponding to commuting automorphisms. So let me just state the theorems that we can prove. Um, not yet on the archive. Uh, we can find, we can tell you the, the biggest possible uh, free abelian subgroup you can build that's generated by these gamma whitehead automorphisms. We can tell you precisely, we can calculate it. Give, give me a graph, I can tell you what this dimension is, what the, this uh, rank of this free abelian subgroup is. Uh, and so the next question is, well, when is this free abelian subgroup exactly equal to the uh, dimension of your k gamma? And we have a condition. So here's a theorem. Uh, yeah. So we say a, a vertex is principal if its link isn't in any bigger link. So, uh, and then we look at the, uh, the, here's the criterion. Supposing I have a vertex that's not principal, so its link is in a bigger link. Here's the link. Suppose it's in some bigger link. So that guy has a bigger link than that guy. Um, and supposing there's also something else in this bigger link. If it's true that whenever I have this situation, then these two m's are actually in the same component somehow of, of gamma minus the star of u, then it's always true that uh, the VCD is exactly equal to the rank of this, this free abelian subgroup. So I'm pretty much uh, right. OK, so that's, that's nice. This is something that's, here's an example of a graph in which this is true. There are lots of examples. Uh, here, but here's the theorem too. Sometimes it's not true. Sometimes the dimension of this space is strictly bigger than the rank of this free abelian group you can build. If in addition there's another condition that these uh, non-principal guys, uh, almost everything within distance two of them is bigger than them, then in fact this k gamma has an equivariant and invariant deformation retract of strictly smaller dimension. And in fact, you can, uh, in many of these cases, you can uh, retract this space down onto a space of dimension equal to the rank of this subgroup, this free abelian subgroup you can make. So this is a condition under, under which this happens, and there's an example that where it happens. Uh, 
the dimension of the space is six and the VCD is only five. So let me just uh, state some conjectures from everything. So for out of Fn, the rank of the biggest abelian subgroup you can build inside of out of Fn is exactly the VCD of out of Fn. And that my feeling is that should be true for this untwisted subgroup as well, so that's the first conjecture, that the VCD is exactly the rank of this abelian subgroup. Um, right. So it's, it's conceivable that you could find some other free abelian subgroup that wasn't generated by gamma whitehead automorphisms, but I don't think, I think, I think the second one is just a true conjecture, so I won't say anything. <coughs> um, Another thing, as I mentioned, for out of Fn, all the solvable subgroups are virtually abelian. <laughs> and I can prove, well, Ruth and I have proved for many classes of, of graphs that uh, this, is, this is true for these untwisted automorphism groups as well. Every solvable subgroup of uh, U of A gamma is virtually abelian, but it's not, it's not a theorem yet. It's only true in lots of cases. So those are some conjectures related to this. What is the second conjecture? Uh, the rank is just the, the, the rank of the largest free abelian subgroup inside of U of A gamma. So this guy M of L is a, the rank of the largest <coughs> free abelian subgroup in U of A gamma that's generated by these gamma whitehead automorphisms. But there could be some weird other free abelian subgroup somewhere in there. I don't think so but there could be. So let me just say in, in summary, maybe this is the point, if I, if I want to study this group, in particular the untwisted subgroup, which is the part of this group that I really don't understand, I should replace finite graphs, as in the study of free groups, the outer automorphisms of free groups, with finite locally had zero cube complexes with the right fundamental group. And uh, that will give me, well, will give you then a contractible space with a proper co-compact U of gamma action. And uh, right, and most of my talk was about trying to use that to, to get a better handle on the VCD. That was the rest of my talk. But um, I should say that there, th as I said, there are many properties shared by out that, that I listed at the beginning, some properties of out of F n that are, that are shared by out of Fn and out of z to the n, <coughs> right? And it turns out that many of those properties are also shared by um, all out of A gammas. And there's a list of people that have proved theorems some people, some of the people who have proved theorems in this way. So here's the question for Alan. Uh, when does out of A gamma have property T? So maybe this space, I mean, we've got a geometry now, so mm -hmm. it's conceivable that could help understand this question. And that's my last slide. The conjecture about solvable subgroups, it fails for G and Z, right? Right. I was talking about the untwisted subgroup. So, um, of course, for G, L, and Z, uh, it's generated by twist. It is the twisted subgroup of itself. So, um, yeah, I guess it's not quite true to say that it's a parabolic subgroup in that case. But, yeah. No, I'm just talking about the untwisted subgroup. <coughs> Can we expect that every solvable subgroup of out A gamma is uh, finitely generated? Uh, yes. I think that's true. I think it's in a paper by Day, Matt Day. Yeah. So we know a fair amount about solvable subgroups. We know lots of interesting examples. And 
And, and as I said, in, in many cases, we know when the solvable subgroups are um, either solvable subgroups of GLN, a little GLNZ inside of out of A gamma, or, um, uh, or they're f uh, virtually abelian. So yeah, we know a lot about solvable subgroups in general, but this question we don't know. And can we expect that the cohomological dimension is always achieved by a nilpotent subgroup? That's a good question. <laughs> I would think so. But uh, based just on ex ex examples, evidence, uh, evidence of examples, uh, I think that's probably true. But I can't prove it. Maybe you can. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you.